quite a number of years dealing primarily along the lines of a lot of horticulture areas, uh, including uh, flowers, annuals, perennials, ornamental grasses, uh, herbs, um, vegetable gardening, and uh, a number of other topics. So tonight I'm going to be presenting, uh, actually, as you can see, the basics of growing herbs. This isn't anything extraordinary, and it doesn't uh, solve any or go to any commercial angles. But to talk about some of the common herbs that people have in, are in their gardens, or if you're starting gardening for the very first time, uh, some of the herbs that you might want to think about. The way that I would like to run this evening's presentation is that about halfway through, I'm going to uh, stop and I'll take any questions verbally that you might have. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll also allow for some verbal questions, maybe five or ten minutes, and then uh, switch over to the chat room. So that's kind of the way we'll we'll get it. So you, if you have any questions, you might want to be thinking about them or writing them down so that you're ready to go when we get to that particular part. So if you'd move to your uh, next slide, just a little bit of an introduction about herbs in general, is that uh, herbs, I think, can be really fun, fascinating kinds of plants. And they fit in naturally in the landscape. I think they're fun to grow. What they offer versus a lot of other kinds of plants that we have, like flowers, is that they're very tactile. And you you just they invite you to touch them and and smell their fragrances so they add another dimension into the home landscape also uh it's a great way of cutting down on using salt in the diet salt is one of our big culprits as part of our diets and when you substitute in herbs for them uh it's just a great way of um not adding all of that sodium into into our diets which we don't need just a little bit of a clarification between herbs versus spices because there is kind of a distinction is that when we're talking about herbs we're usually referring to plants that are used for flavoring or scenting uh, and the, uh, they can also be used for medicine but I'm not going to address the medicinal side of things uh, tonight and they also can be used for landscaping they differ from spices in that spices can also include the leaves and the flowers but also they tend to uh, they tend to uh, include both barks and roots and uh, stems. The uh, so just on your screen are just some common ones that uh, we'll get into tonight as we go through some of the presentation. So in your um, next slide, I'm going to start off with basil, which is one of the more common herbs that is grown in the home garden and I didn't particularly uh, I'm getting a message that the slides haven't moved forward so I'm assuming you're not running it off of a disk okay um, Let's see. So for these of you that are on link, you you are not seeing the screen. This image is moving forward. Wow. Okay. Well, I I'm advancing them from here. Um. Right. Well, uh, okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to exit out of here. Sorry, uh, and I'm going to upload it again. I know from my side of things, um, the server went down briefly, and then I pulled it back up. So maybe something happened in that process. So I'm going to exit out, and I will be. I'll be. I'll come back again. Sorry for this.
Okay, is anything happening? Privately viewing. No. Oh, great. Is anything happening? No, no. no. All right, how about now? Can anybody see anything now? Okay. Hallelujah. Okay. Whew. Isn't technology great? I love this new system. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. I apologize. Now, where was I? Okay, I wasn't advancing the screen, so I'm going to go back. You saw me. All right, moving on ahead. All right, quickly. Differences between herbs and spices. Herbs, flowers and leaves for the most part, uh, used for flavoring, um, medicinal purpose, which I'm not getting into tonight, landscaping. Spices, on the other hand, typically barks, uh, seeds, stems, usually different kinds of parts. Um, most spices, I'm just going to generalize, tend to be more tropical kind of things that we wouldn't necessarily grow here. That Not that you can't grow some of them, but for the most part, we would not. So, moving into the next slide, I'm going to start off with basil. And basil is one of the more common herbs that people tend to grow in the home garden. Uh, I, I didn't organize these in any particular fashion, so they're just sort of uh, random, if you will. I could have done it by annuals and perennials, or I could have done it alphabetically, but uh, it's just sort of in a random fashion. So the thing about basil is it has this wonderful, warm, kind of an anise flavor fragrance to it. Uh, most people are familiar with the green forms, but there are some other types. They do have flowers, and the image that you see there is beginning to have the flowers form on it. But usually we want to pick those flowers off, cut them off, to put all the energy into the foliage because that's the part that is used. Typically the flowers, for the most part, are not. If you move to your next slide, just a listing of some cultivars that are out there. Both Osmond and Osmond Purple are the same thing. Uh, sometimes you see it listed simply as Osmond without the purple attached to it is a, um, a pretty good cultivar. It's probably not the, the most hardy, uh, whereas the other basils, they don't take cold real at all, but this one doesn't uh, hardly take it beyond 40 degrees. Uh, Genovese is when people think of making pesto. That's the one that most people would use uh, for those purposes. Dark opal is one that also has that purplish red foliage, uh, but it tends to be a little bit more mottled, maybe not as great as the Osman. Both the purple forms, I think, are great for making purple uh, uh, basil vinegars. Uh, you can infuse them into a vinegar and they make just this wonderful pink vinegar that you can make easily at home. Mammoth is one that has larger leaves, so if uh, you're into wrapping chicken with it or that sort of thing, that might come in handy. And also lemon basil, really good for things like poultry and uh, fish as some kind of dishes. Uh, the thing, a couple of things about basil before we move ahead is that the younger leaves are really the most flavorful. Not that the older ones don't have a, a scent or flavor to them, but the youngest ones tend to be the, the strongest in their, their quality. This is one that, uh, first of all, it likes really warm temperatures in the spring, so don't plant it out until after all frost is over with. And then once we get to the other end of the spectrum in the uh, fall, it's probably going to be one of the first things uh, to go. You can dry basil but it really doesn't keep the quality. It's just not as good as the fresh basil. On to your next slide, if you will. Uh, another easy annual is dill, and dill has a really beautiful feathery foliage to it. All parts of dill are edible, from the leaves to the flowers that are often used in making pickles to the dried seed that is added into breads and um, that sort of thing. Very easy from seed. Tends to be a tall plant in the garden. I would look for a cultivar called fern leaf. Fern leaf is a dwarf cultivar that was introduced many, many years ago, but it doesn't get quite as big and lanky as regular um, dill does. Um, I think this is a great plant to have in the border because it's got such a great lacy texture and it's got those yellow flowers during the summertime. But again, you do want to kind of keep it in check because it does have a tendency to seed very heavily, and you might wind up with, you know, once you plant it, you wind up with just a ton of it in the garden. But very, very easy 
uh, from seed once you get it established. And your next slide is a common herb used as a classic edging plant. Uh, in very kind of traditional herb gardens, people use this as a border because it has those nice green leaves and then it, the pink flowers. It has that characteristic onion flavor to it. The leaves are kind of hollow uh, when you slice or cut into them. The flowering occurs in usually sometime around May through June. If you move to your next slide, I think that is the beauty of chives is when it's in flower because you have that abundance of those blooms. Uh, all parts of this plant are edible as well. You can eat the leaves. A lot of people chop them up into various dishes like egg dishes and omelets and things like cottage cheese. But the flowers are also edible and they also impart a little bit of a mild onion flavor. And you can chop those up into things like egg dishes or they also make a real beautiful uh, vinegar. Now once it gets past its flowering stage it tends to get a little bit floppy and then it becomes a little bit unkempt. So what I like to do with mine is I give them a buzz cut. I just come in and shear all of the whole plant back down to about three inches from the ground and it is going to look bad for several weeks but it does bounce back with some really new fresh kind of growth and it's a nice way to kind of rejuvenate uh, the plant. This is also a beautiful herb to plant with Siberian iris because it does flower about the same time and you get that wonderful color complement between the two of them. If you move to your next slide, another relative of it in the onion family is garlic chives. Now I'm going to give you the good and the bad about garlic chives. The good part is that this is one of the latest flowering herbs that we have and it has these wonderful white flowers that appear usually in oh, August or so. Uh, the plant has a characteristic garlic flavor about it, hence its common name. The leaves tend to be a little more, more flat than uh, regular chives. Chives are hollow. Um, so when you're out in the garden, even on a warm day, you'll kind of get that warm garlicky fragrance from it, which can be quite pleasant. Now the downside of it is, and I show you this on the lower left of your screen is that once those flowers are finished they each one forms a little black seed and those little black seeds go all over the garden and uh, the problem with garlic chives is it tends to be really quite invasive so if you want to keep that in check what I would recommend is cutting off those flowers once they are finished and that way you won't have to uh, deal with all those little uh, garlic chive chivelings coming up uh, out in the garden but it's really a pretty plant and I think a lot of people overlook it and kind of turn their nose up but it really you can't beat it for that late season bloom with it. On to your next slide is sage which is has been immortalized in the song parsley sage rosemary and thyme. Um, one of the very common perennials that people associate with things like uh, particularly Thanksgiving or holidays when they're making turkey and things like sage dressing. In its basic form the leaves are very thick and kind of leathery and you can see they have that pebbly texture as you can see on the image on your screen there. The uh, It's a plant that's going to be about two to three feet tall and mounded in its shape. If you move to your next slide you can kind of get a feel for what the overall habit is. It is very nice and mounded, particularly when it's a little bit of a younger plant. Unfortunately, as time goes on, it does lose a little bit of that nice shape and gets uh, gets a little bit woody in its character. So you just need to you know keep it cut back, pinch it uh, to keep it in shape. And after several years, you might want to think about rejuvenating and starting over with a newer one. Those flowers are kind of a purplish blue, and typically they're produced in late spring, usually May, uh, possibly in a little bit of, of June. But it's really pretty when it is in flower. Once you establish it, there's really not much care that you need to give it. I would just make sure that you do have a really well-drained site, and then once it is done flowering, cut it back. Now there are some other cultivars that are kind of interesting. If you move to your uh, next slide, I want to show you uh, three of them. We're going to start with this first one called Burgarten, which translates into City Garden. And I actually like Burgarten better than just the straight species 
of salvia because you can see the leaves are much larger. They still have that silvery, this might have just a little bit more silver look to it than the straight species does, but it's more of a rounded leaf and it's a much larger leaf. I love to tuck this into my flower beds and into my border, especially with things like uh, red flowers or purple blue or purple flowers or blue flowers because it's a really nice complement to it and it just adds a nice foliage textural element into the landscape. This would also be a great plant if you were doing a gray green garden or a white garden. This would just fit in perfectly. If you move to your next slide, two more cultivars that I think are worth noting uh, on your upper left is a cultivar called Purple Rassens or purple basil, and then on the lower right is one called aria, also called golden sage. They also sell this under the cultivar name of Icterina. Uh, you tend to see the yellow one, at least I tend to see it a little bit more than the purple one, but both of them can be used very much like regular sages. In other words, you can cook with it. Most people don't because they're just growing it strictly for its ornamental value. The purple one it's particularly the new growth that has that purplish color. You can see through on the image there that as those leaves mature, they do lose a little bit of that purple color and become just more green. The yellow one, I see this sold quite a bit throughout the year, uh, especially as we get into the fall of the year, they're pushing this as a nice fall component for fall types of planters where you're putting in some grasses and pansies and osteospermum is another kind of uh, cool season plant so it does make a nice little component to put into a mixed planter if you're doing that sort of thing and again you have the advantage of uh, you know you can touch it brush uh, you know brush the leaves and they give you that nice sage kind of uh, fragrance to it now both of these cultivars are a little less vigorous than the um, the traditional straight species so that's just something to keep in mind not that that's bad or anything it's just that they're not as they tend to get not quite as large as the other ones on to your next slide staying in the sa the sage family the salvia family and the salvia family really is a pretty big family when you start looking at all the species that it presents or includes this one is pineapple sage and uh, it is a plant that tends to get to be about three feet by three feet, so three feet tall, three feet wide. The basic form of it has the green leaves, as you see in the upper right, but it has these wonderful cardinal red flowers that appear usually late summer. And I think that that's the thing that I find charming about it is that as it you get into late summer and into fall, when a lot of other things are beginning to just kind of go downhill, you know, this is one of those plants that you can look forward to, and I think that's. That, that's the nice thing about being gar or being into gardening is that you look forward to different times of the year when certain things are blooming. It, hummingbirds love this. There's a cultivar that I prefer rather than just the straight species, and it is called Pineapple uh, Delicious. And uh, Pineapple Delicious is uh, has a kind of a chartreuse yellow leaf to it, which... Uh, I'm a big fan of chartreuse kind of colors in the garden because I think it just adds a nice pop. But you, uh, with that particular cultivar, you've got the yellow leaves and the red flowers that are against it. All right, switching from the sages, if you'd move to your next slide, is uh, French tarragon. And French tarragon has been grown for, you know, hundreds of years, actually, um, and I want to distinguish between French tarragon and Russian tarragon. French tarragon is always grown from a cutting or from a division of an established plant. Russian tarragon, on the other hand, is uh, grown from seed. And the difference between the two is that the F Russian tarragon is that it's uh, referred to as being inferior because it just lacks the flavor and the aroma that the French tarragon does. Now the French tarragon has a little bit of a anise or licorice kind of flavor with a little bit of a bite to it. Typically, you'll see this used with a lot of fish dishes because it helps to negate that fishy flavor that some of those uh, that some of the fish can have. The habit on it tends to be upright, but it can be a little bit uh, floppy. Um, so you just want to take that into account. It doesn't always hold itself up beautifully like a lot of our plants 
uh, do or what a lot of people like in their garden. Some people are very regimented and want everything to be standing up and perfect and staked and all of that. Well, this is not one of those plants that's going to have a little bit more of a relaxed habit uh, about it. The only trick I would uh, pass on about French tarragon is that you do want to keep the crown dry, particularly during the winter time if possible. In other words, you don't want it set in a low line area where water might collect or where it stays wet for long periods of uh, time. On to your next slide is another grouping of plants that uh, uh, people favor, and this is the oreganos. And oregano kind of really refers to a flavor, if you will, rather than one particular type. What I have given you on your screen are three different species of oregano. Um, and they do all kind of differ. I'm going to start from the bottom with sweet marjoram. And sweet marjoram is uh, one of the variety, it's in the oregonum genus, but it is one of uh, the types or one of the species that is maybe a little bit more cold sensitive. So often you will see this grown as an annual or sold as an annual. It uh, tends to have little tiny clusters of pink flowers uh, when it is in bloom, and they almost look kind of like a, a knot, if you will. Uh, it's so-so. As far as flavoring goes, it is so-so. As far as a landscaping plant, it it is fine. Uh, the next plant up is common oregano, and common oregano has the co has, has another common name called wild marjoram, and it doesn't really have much flavor either. The one that is the El Primo one is the one listed there as Greek oregano. So if you are into uh, making Italian dishes and pizzas and that sort of thing, you want to go with Greek oregano. The downside of Greek oregano is that it is not hardy. So you probably need to be, uh, you'll need to replant it every year unless you try and protect it, uh, bring it indoors or grow it, um, grow it inside for the winter time. When you buy oregano, what I would suggest is smell the leaves, crush the leaves, because what it should have is a real strong, pungent bite to it. If you close your eyes and you crush the leaf and smell it, you should think of pizza, uh, because that uh, Greek oregano is what gives pizza that characteristic, uh, unique flavor that, that it has. So do look for Greek oregano. It differs from the other ones in that it's going to have uh, typically white flowers. On to your uh, next slide, I want to talk about a couple of types of parsley. Parsley also tends to be a very classic edging plant that people put in their uh, herb gardens, but I think it also makes a nice addition into a flower border. I'm going to start with this type. There are two main types. The, the type that I want to start here is called curled parsley, and this is the one that you typically see on a... Um, when you eat at a restaurant, they'll put a little sprig of parsley on there as a garnish, and it's very high in vitamin C. It actually is good for you. Most people just kind of just leave it on the plate when they're finished eating, but it actually is kind of a natural breath freshener, and it does contain vitamin C. Um, so this has the real tight curled leaves to it. Typically, it does not have as good of a flavor. Not that parsley has a particular flavor about it. It's kind of a fresh flavor. But the one that is more preferred for flavoring, if you would move to your next slide, is the Italian parsley, or what we call flat parsley. And as I mentioned, it doesn't really have a flavor per se. Parsley is usually added into soups and stews to help kind of marry and blend some of the other spices and flavorings that are added into that particular dish. On the previous slide, I had the words that these are biennials. And by bi biennial, what we mean is that the first year you get a nice growth of foliage, and then it doesn't flower or produce seed until the second year. So it overwinters, and then it flowers the second year. Now, the, the by the second year, it really doesn't look like much of anything because it's going to go to bloom, and then it is, has finished its life cycle. So what I would re recommend is that you uh, only grow it as an annual, and then uh, you know replant the next year. Don't don't keep it over and take up the space by letting it go to seed because it's not really worth doing so. Uh, both types of these parsley's will take cooler weather, so at this time of the year, this would be something that could go out quite easily. Uh, once, of course, you've acclimated it from the greenhouse that you bought it from, but they will take some cool weather. Very much unlike basil, 
that we started off with this evening. Basil doesn't like any cool or cold whatsoever, so you want to make sure you hold off on that particular one before you set it uh, outside. One other note before I leave the parsley is that on the parsleys and sometimes on uh, fennel, which we're going to get to in a little bit, you will sometimes find uh, the larva of black swallowtail, and it is a, a worm, caterpillar-like worm with uh, black uh, black and yellow markings to it. So sometimes you'll find them feeding on the plant. Some people actually plant uh, members of the parsley family, Queen Anne's lace and parsley and fennel and the like, to attract that particular uh, larva and its uh, adult butterflies. On to your next slide is a, an herb that Shakespeare made uh, immortal by saying that rosemary was for remembrance. Rosemary has that wonderful fragrance to it that is kind of uh, kind of piney in a sense. Uh, beautiful needle-like foliage. It is a tender perennial, as you see listed there, which means that it isn't that hardy here in Illinois, with the exception of some cultivars. And the one that is the most hardiest cultivar of rosemary is called ARP, A-R-P. It was developed or discovered in ARP, Texas. So you might want to look for that one uh, rather than trying to replace those plants every single uh, year. Uh, there can most of, most of the rosemaries that are out there are upright, but there are some trailing ones that I think are nice additions into mixed containers where you can let that spill over the sides very much like you would use ivy or sweet potato or a lot of the other things that um, people use as a, a cascade or a spiller in, uh, in those containers. The flowers uh, for the most part are blue, but uh, sometimes you'll find them with pink flowers, or sometimes you'll find cultivars that have white flowers to them. It's, it's really a versatile plant. Some people train them in topiaries and standards and, uh, and the like, but um, there's also, before I leave this particular slide, there is a cultivar out there called Shish Kebab that just came to my mind. They introduced I don't know, two, three years ago, time kind of goes fast, but uh, it has these really long straight stems that you can kind of strip off uh, the leaves and you can use it as a natural skewer for uh, grilling and for barbecues. All right, if you move to your next slide, some nice low-growing perennials that I think are great in uh, rock gardens and as edging in the landscape are the times and the times are really a uh, a very large group and you when you start looking at the number of cultivars that are out there it's it's kind of mind-boggling because there are just dozens of them that exist they're all woody perennials they're all very low growing probably the tallest one would be maybe 15 inches the lowest one perhaps about six inches they all kind of hug the ground and so they make good ground covers some of them make good um, uh, plans for as uh, steppables, kind of between stepping stones. If you're going to put them between stepping stones, I would suggest growing uh, either woolly thyme or creeping thyme because those tend to take the foot traffic a little bit more than uh, some of the other types. The bees also uh, love them. Sorry, I didn't mean to go back there. Uh, the bees also love them. Uh, thyme jelly is uh, is is wonderful if you make that. Uh, thyme honey is also wonderful. Uh, they will stay good for about three to five years and after about that time you might want to think about replanting them because they tend to get kind of woody in their character and they really kind of lose their their looks about them. They get a little bit lanky and a little bit rangy. Um, so, But five years is a pretty good time and then think about reestablishing it so you get uh, you know some nice plants. If you would, oh, before I uh, move ahead, one other thing about times that just occurred to me is that you want to make sure you have a nice sandy, warm, sandy soil or warm location because they are native to the Mediterranean, so you want to try and get those same kind of conditions. All right, in your next slide, a member of the mint family is lemon balm. And what I like about lemon balm is it has that fresh, lemon fragrance to it. Now, since it is a member of the mint family, it is going to spread. And especially if you give it a moist location, that's what it's going to like. It will increase in size quite nicely. 
that can't that that's not a problem unless you've got it really tight in with other things and then it will certainly there will be a battle for the lemon balms in your garden so you have to kind of watch that out um, it isn't really known or grown for its flowers the flowers are very small and white and usually appear kind of along the stems and the axles of the leaves uh, if the leaves turn yellow on this one, that means you're keeping a little bit too dry. So its its first preference for a location is going to be full sun with a little bit of a moist soil. It's a nice herb to put on, you use some of the fresh leaves on fruit salads or in a, in a regular salad or even using the leaves for beverages. All right, on to your next slide is a plant that is evergreen uh, in its warmer zones but it is a tender plant for us so we would grow it as an outdoor plant and then you either need to winter it indoors or if you have a greenhouse but it will not tolerate our outdoor conditions because this is a zone 8 plant in its natural habitat it gets to be a tree that is about 10 feet tall a lot of people use bay leaves as a um, kind of ingredient in soups and stews and that sort of thing. It isn't grown for its flowers. On your slide there, on your screen there, you see the flowers, are, they're very small and minute, kind of tucked along in the main stem of those leaves. But the leaves are beautiful. They are very shiny. They're dark green. They just have a wonderful look about them. They dry beautifully. Some people dry them and hold them for the wintertime to use for uh, cooking purposes. I've seen wreaths made out of them, which can be quite uh, attractive. So if you're growing this, you can simply uh, take off the leaves as you uh, need them. I'm going to uh, stop there and take some questions if we have any. Is anybody out there? We have a question here in Boone County. Yes, I have a go ahead. Lemon balm that's very um it's gotten out of control and I'm wondering how do I can I get rid of some of it without killing all of it? Yeah I yes, I when you say out of control, I'm assuming you mean that it's gotten quite big and diameter wise. Everywhere. And I would um Yes, I would simply go wherever the crown is and just start digging up to re to reduce it to the size that you want. You are not going to kill um, you're not going to kill the lemon balm. I mean, it is pretty tough. It is it's it's like a mint. You can hardly do much to do that. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to take verbal questions here. I'll do the chat uh, towards the end of. Maybe I wasn't coming through this morning, uh, this after, or this evening, so I got it all mixed up here. Uh, I'll take some verbal questions now, and then we'll take some verbal questions towards the end, and then we'll finish up with the chat room. Uh, Jim, we have a question here in Chicago um, about lemon balm. Mm -hmm. After a while, I've had it a number of years, and it's getting long and woody, and the leaves aren't as good as it was. And this what is it just that do? Uh, if somebody's closer to the microphone, if they could repeat that for me. Sure. She said that the lemon balm was, after a number of years, is getting kind of woody and the leaves aren't as good as they used to be. What do you recommend for that? What I would recommend is I would dig it up and I would divide it. it that should help to reestablish it as a, a fresher plant. So it could be that it's just it's getting too big of a crown, too woody, too old. So I would dig it up, split it into sections, and either keep the sections or just replant one portion of it. Because um, I think it just needs rejuvenation is what it sounds like. Okay. Do you recommend that technique when you were saying the woolly time would only last three to five years? It, not so much woolly, yeah. Not so much woolly time. I was thinking more of like the the English time. Uh, woolly time is very low growing. Um, woody woolly time typically doesn't get woody in its character, but English time wood and lemon time and there's a whole bunch of others would would get woody. Um, dividing it doesn't really help. It, there's not much to divide in a 
in an in a time plant. It's just it's it's woody and it's just, it's finished. So it's not there's not much to divide. Okay, thanks. Just compost it. <laughs> there you go. Right, and and support the green industry and you know buy a new one. Do you have a preference in dividing the herbs? Would you do that in spring or fall? Typically, division is done in the spring. That way, you, that plant has time to get established and get going. The trouble with fall, depending upon what it is, it may not survive. Now, if you were dividing mints, I think you could split that any time and they would live. Lemon balm would probably live. Most of the other stuff, I, I wouldn't do it in the fall. Spring gives them time to establish and grow through the summer. Thank you. Other verbal questions? I'll, I'll get to the chat room after we get done uh, with the presentation. All right, I'm going to jump ahead here and go into sweet fennel. So on fennel, we're going to look at a couple of uh, types here. Um, it is typical sweet fennel is usually grown as an annual and what i love about uh, fennel is it, it it has great height and i have seen combinations of this with um i've seen this used in kind of um what do i want to say um you know one of the styles now in gardening is sort of uh, meadow meadows and prairies and that sort of thing and i have seen this used in plantings where you've got echinaceas and it was with Russian sage and it just made the most beautiful combination of plants because you had the yellow flowers on the fennel and the the blue, lavender blue and the, the Russian sage and you had the purple pink in the, in the echinacea so I think it's a great landscaping plant now it is very weedy is you know if you let all of those flowers go to seed all that seed drops down and it can become quite invasive in uh, that sense but this just has great texture about it and it has height which is also kind of a nice thing in your next slide another version of it that I also like to use as a landscaping plant is bronze fennel and uh, this has the same characteristics of the one we just looked at but the foliage on it is more of a smoky kind of a purplish color and I just think that's really nice and nice and rich um, it you might need to support it it does need full sun, well-drained soil, and um, other than that, it's very easy to grow, but do watch the receding part of it. Fennel is also associated quite a bit with things like fish dishes because it's got a kind of a licorice, anise kind of a, a flavor about it. But I use it more as a landscaping plant. I'm not usually so much into using it for the, the cooking part of it. All right, on to your next slide is a little bit of a a uh, little bit of a lesser known plant and that is with caraway and caraway is also another one of those plants that is a biennial and that the first year you're going to have the foliage about it and then it doesn't flower until the second year uh, but it's a little bit of a demure, demure plant uh, I would say it doesn't fall into the really top ten of plants that people grow in their gardens you know most people would think of parsley sage rosemary thyme and that sort of thing uh, in the second year it's going to produce those little tiny uh, white flowers those little umbels and then following them are going to be the seed most people think of using caraway in um, things like uh, cab cabbage it's associated with cabbage very easily a lot of breads sometimes um, that sort of thing uh, but this is an easy one to grow from seed uh, and not just a nice herb to kind of tuck into a, a garden setting. All right, on to your next slide is another kind of a, a demure thing, although this is a little bit more well-known than the uh, uh, caraway is. Coriander has a, kind of a, if you will, a split personality in that uh, the leaves are used, but also the seed is as well. The leaves are most popularly known as cilantro. So if you have ever eaten uh, salsa or you've made salsas, this is what gives a salsa its real pungent kind of a kick. The uh, seeds, or if you let the plant go to seed, is referred to as coriander. And it uh, kind of has an interesting scent about it. 
Uh, I've heard it been described sometimes as smelling like uh, like bed bugs, although I've never smelled bed bugs, but kind of a, a an odd scent about it. But I think it is kind of an interesting thing. So if you are into making salsas, certainly uh, check out growing coriander. Very easy to do so. You're probably not going to find transplants of this, so uh, just start it from seed and you will be good to go. Full sun, average kind of soil. All right, on to your next slide is a plant that I also like to use in the landscape, but it also has some uh, culinary purposes as well, and that is the nasturtium. And the thing that I like about nasturtiums is that you find these really bright, wonderful colors that you don't find in other kinds of annuals. They're just a, a different, it's hard to explain, I'm sure, uh, but just colors that are more vibrant and different than you know, things like petunias or geraniums or marigolds or that sort of thing. They are kind of a sprawling plant. They do tend to like cooler weather, so during the summertime they may languish just a little bit. Uh, so you'll find them, they tend to do better in early summer, and then they'll pick up again in fall once the weather uh, gets a little bit uh, more conducive for their growth. Uh, it's also a good frost indicator, just like basil is because once we get a frost uh, the plants are going to be wiped out. The um, flowers and the leaves are edible. Uh, they have a kind of a peppery flavor to it. The flowers, if you do use them, I have seen this uh, advertised and in books they talk about it, is to take the flowers and you uh, what you want to do is pull out the floral parts, the stamens and the pistil at the inside, and then they're usually stuffed with cream cheese or chicken salad or that sort of thing. I have never done this. I mean, the flowers aren't that big, so I'm thinking there's really not a whole lot of room there for chicken salad. So if you do that, you want to make sure you invite some people over that are uh, that eat like birds because there's really not much there to uh to consume, but I think it's a great idea. I just don't know how that translates into, you know, being something that's very, very practical. But this is a beautiful plant to include out in the garden. If you have a, um, what do I want to say, kind of a um, English style garden where it's it's very informal, this is a beautiful plant to let spill out onto the path. One other trick before we leave nasturtium is that uh, it does help. To, they're they're very easy from seed. But it does help to sow the seed, soak the seeds in water overnight for 24 hours, and that helps to leach out some inhibitors, and then you're good to go. But very large seeds, very easy to plant from seeds. All right, on to your next slide. Talk a little bit about scented geraniums. is a very large group of plants, and these are technically pelargoniums. They differ from what we would call true geraniums. True geraniums are more of a tropical plant. These are more of a... Uh, I'm sorry, these are tropical, true geraniums are more temperate. And so since they are tropical, they are treated as tender perennials, which means at the end of the season, you either let them go, you've treated them as annuals, or you can bring them inside for the winter time and overwinter them on a sunny window and take them back out again the next year. There are just hundreds of scented geraniums that are out there. There's a lot of distinct fragrances to them. The most popular ones would be like rose and lemon, mint, um, some of them smell great, some of them smell like bubble gum, some of them smell like dishwater. So you just need to, if you're into the scent part of it, you just need to do some experimenting at the store or place where you're buying them, the greenhouse where you're buying them. But what I like about them is that they have these wonderful textures, the leaf shapes. The flowers are very secondary. You can see the flowers on the image that you're looking at. They're not the showy flowers like a, a bedding geranium. Those are huge umbels. These are sort of sparse and not quite as showy. So it's really the foliage that is the uh, focal point. In your next slide, just to show you another example and some uses of them, on your left side of the screen is peppermint geranium, and it has this really nice, very fuzzy leaf to it and a nice peppermint fragrance about it. They're great as foliage additions into a garden, kind of filler, if you will. With other plants, it might be the stars. On the lower right, uh, there are some scented geraniums grown in containers, so I think they make nice additions in a mixed planter. On to your next slide, we'll look at the lavenders. And the lavenders also have this wonderful light fragrance about them. A couple of things about lavenders is that they typically need to have a very well-drained soil, particularly as we get through and into the winter time. You want to make sure that water doesn't collect around those plants because that's typically what people um, 
the problems they have with lavender is usually because the soil is too heavy, too much clay, stays too wet, the lavenders don't survive. On your next screen, to show you the flowers, I think the flowers are a nice combination with the leaves. The leaves have a kind of a silvery look about them. The flowers usually are lavender blue, but there are white cultivars that are out there and there are pink cultivars as well. They tend to be not quite as common, but they do exist. Uh, most of them are going to be within about a one to three foot range. And in addition to that good drainage, they also need to have good air circulation around because they can get kind of a mildew. Um, this is a plant where once we, we're at this time of the year in the spring, do a little bit of trimming and cleanup to them before they start their growth. You want to remove any of the dead that might have happened over the over the winter time. Before we leave the lavenders, I just want to mention that um, the ones that we would grow would be the English or the French lavenders. There are a type. There is a type out there called Spanish lavender, which has these beautiful flowers that are probably twice the size of the English or the French, and they can be very enticing. But the downside of the Spanish lavenders is that they are not hardy. So just be aware of that when you uh, go to purchase them. All right, on to your next plant. I mean, on to your next slide is a uh, plant that looks very much like celery, and this is lovage. Uh, this is also one of those really tall herbs to have in the garden. We looked at the fennels just a little bit ago, but this is another one that easily gets to be uh, sometimes seven feet. So this is for the back of the herb garden or uh, as a nice architectural plant in a mixed border. It is used very much like celery. It has that same kind of celery flavor, so you could add it into um, something that you're cooking that where you would typically use celery. Uh, the stems are hollow, so some people do use them as kind of a natural straw. This will take full sun going into partial shade and not really particular about the soil. All right, on your next slide, if you will, we'll look at the family of mints. And mints are actually, this is a large grouping. There are numerous species. The two that are the most popular are spearmint and peppermint. Spearmint, typically used for things like toothpaste and that sort of thing. Peppermint, more used for things like candies, gums, and the like. The way that I usually tell the two apart, because they can look extremely similar, is the uh, peppermint will have pinkish red stems to it. And I always think of peppermint candy, you know, the, the kind that is white and red striped. So that shows how I can tell the two uh, apart. A couple of other cultivars that you might want to look for. One is chocolate mint, which actually combines the best of all worlds because you've got the flavor of chocolate and you've got the flavor of the mint. A lot, uh, a lot of people use this on desserts if you're using it on like ice cream or I've seen it used as kind of a garnish on top of brownies. And I know that um, Kentucky Derby season is coming up, so if you are into mint juleps, there is a cultivar called Kentucky Kernel that has this really strong mint flavor. Now, you don't have to use it for um, mint juleps. You could also use it for flavoring iced teas and other kind of beverages. Now, here's the downside of mint is that it is very invasive, and it doesn't just kind of uh, romp through your garden. It's going to jog through your garden or sprint to your, through your garden, so you want to make sure that uh, not Number one, if that's what you want to do, give it the room to do so. If you have it planted around other things, you might consider planting it in a pot and sink the pot into the ground. Otherwise, it is going to go absolutely crazy. I've seen it go under sidewalks. I've seen it grow through concrete, uh, and it will just simply take over. I want to mention two cultivars that are hot off the press, um, they're going to be brand new, and maybe I, sh I should probably shouldn't mention because you won't find them this year. They are introduced this year, and then they will be into the trade next year. And one of them is strawberry mint, and you can just imagine uh, the associations that you could do with that. And then there's also one called Thai mint, which has a really strong flavor as well. But uh, again, you won't find them this year. They will be into the marketplace in 2015. Now, switching from the uh, individual plants, if you'd move to your next slide, I want to focus the rest of my presentation this evening by talking about growing uh, the herbs and caring for them and uh, finish up with some tips about 
um, how to harvest them. So if you would move to your next slide, we're, we'll talk just a little bit about side. I've mentioned some things as we've talked about the individual herbs. For the most part, what we're looking for in an herb garden is one that gets full sun, so at least six hours of sunlight per day. And we really want just an average soil. Now this is a little bit contrary to when we're growing other things, i.e. vegetables, fruits, flowers, and the like. We usually talk about having a good fertile soil. But where we're growing herbs, typically you want lower fertility because that plant is going to put on a lot of growth that is very low in flavor. So just an average soil is fine. It should have good drainage. Some of the herbs we talked about tonight do like it moist. We mentioned lemon balm. Rosemary also likes a little bit of a, and we're not talking wet, we're just talking that it stays or is moist or that you make sure there is moisture there. And of course the mints like a, a moist site. Uh, contrary to that would be the Mediterranean types of herbs. Times particularly like it sunny, they like it dry, and they like a little bit of a sandier, well-drained location. If you move to your next slide, I think a lot of the herbs, particularly the smaller ones, are great in containers. There are some advantages to growing them in containers. Uh, number one, they're very portable. You can have them on your patio. You can, um, if they're tender ones at the end of the season, you can bring them indoors. Now if they are growing in containers then the care for them is a little bit different than in the ground because their watering needs are going to increase. Where you have a container dependent upon the size of that container and what soil mix is used, you may be watering that container a couple of times a day. So the watering needs typically tend to increase. Now while we do want average fertility for herbs in the ground, when they are in a container since that soil is being leached leached, leached every time you water, I would add in some fertile, I would fertilize with a soluble fertilizer maybe once every couple of weeks or once a month just to make sure that there is some nutrition there because you will probably see the signs of uh, low or poor nutrition resulting in, in foliage color and in the growth of the plants. And then finally since they are in a container you probably need to do a little bit more pinching to keep them compact and keep them looking fairly uh, well. What you're looking at there are actually a number of rosemaries. The one in front is one that's trained into a standard or a topiary where they've pinched off all the lower leaves, lower stems as they developed and uh, developed it into kind of a tree. All right, on to your next slide. Talk a little bit about harvesting. So we'll look at harvesting annuals first and then we'll look at uh, perennials. For the annuals, typically you can use them pretty severely because they only have that one growing season. They're only be growing through June, July, August until they get to frost. If you are using the foliage, typically any time before it flowers is what is preferred. If you do want the seed from them, so that would be things like fennel or dill as some examples, you would let them go to flower, go to seed, and the plant is going to mature. Now obviously if you keep them from flowering, you are um, kind of extending the life cycle a little bit because if you think about what an annual does, its goal is to grow, produce its seed, and then it dies. So once it starts to produce seed, that's a signal that its life cycle is over. Uh, if you move to your next slide, just a tip about harvesting for the seed. So again, if you're doing the things like uh, coriander or fennel or dill, is that you need to capture those seeds just as they are going from yellow to brown. If you wait until they are completely brown, they're going to fall off and shatter and you're not going to have any harvest. So you get them just as they're turning, uh, cut several stems of the plant, place those stems with the seed heads into a paper bag, tie it, move it to a warm location, and after a, it depend upon the temperature and humidity, but after a couple of weeks, uh, the seeds will be dry and you can shake them off and they will be in the bag so you can collect them and gather them. All right, if you have moved to your next slide, a little a uh, few tips about perennial herbs is that typically they're not harvested nearly as severely as annual ones would be. Annual ones you can kind of strip them off and you know they're they're finished for the season. With perennials, typically the rule of thumb is to not remove any more than one third of what is there. And avoid really doing any heavy fall pruning. Particularly, I'm thinking of things like sage is where I've seen some examples of it. If you do prune too much in the fall, you can kiss it goodbye because that plant is not coming back in the 
um, the next spring. So a lot of people like to clean things up in the fall, and sometimes they get heavy-handed with their pruning shears. This is not one of those places to do that. All right, on to your next slide. A couple of things about winter protection. So if we have some herbs, like you see listed there, winter savory, we did not talk about this evening, uh, but the thymes and lavender, they can be a little bit touchy depending upon where they are located. So they would be quite uh, risky. So some things to do to get them ready, if you would move to your next slide, is number one, we always go back to site, and I think uh, site really goes a long way in how plants grow and how well they do. So we want to make sure we have really good drainage, even if it's something that is, you know, you might not think is important. I mean, lavenders definitely need drainage, but all of the herbs need pretty good drainage. If there is a heavy soil, has a lot of clay, think about amending it with organic matter, compost, that sort of thing, or creating raised beds so that you improve the drainage there. Also, other things that make sure those plants get through the winter, don't do any fertilizing late. Fertilizer promotes growth. Don't do pruning late. And what, what by late, what I mean is usually after August, September, anything that's heavy pruning is going to promote growth that also will not harden uh, off before winter time. And then finally, we can overwinter things indoors. Rosemaries, Greek oregano, as some examples, uh, would be a way to keep them from one year to the next. If you move to your next slide, some tips for doing so. Number one, start early. So if you are going to be bringing in scented geraniums, you want to start thinking about that probably in September. If you are digging it from the ground, dig it up. Make sure you take as much of the roots as you can. Move them into pots. Keep them outside. Let them get used to growing in a pot before you bring it into the home where there's lower light, lower humidity. Uh, if you are digging them up one day, putting them in a pot and bringing them in the next day, uh, it's not going to work. That plant has to get used to being grown in a container. Now, if it's already in a container, that's much less of a problem because uh, it doesn't have the shock of that root system being messed with. But it is easily done. Now, once you bring them indoors, if you move to your next slide, just some things to think about. Number one, keep them in a place where there is really bright light, as much light as possible. So this is usually going to be a west window, could be a south window. Um, it is really challenging at best. I will preface that with, with trying to grow herbs indoors. Uh, so as bright a light as possible, as cool a temperature as possible. So this might be a room that you do not use where the uh, it's not heated quite as much. Uh, watch the watering. They are not going to need as much water indoors as they did out of doors. Uh, the only exception to that is with rosemary, is that it typically likes to be kept moist. And very often, the one I hear the most about from people trying to keep herbs is with rosemary. And they'll say, my rosemary died. My rosemary died when I brought it in. And I'd say most of the time, it's because of it's kept too dry. Insects would be another thing to watch for because things like aphids uh, are hitchhikers. So once they're, you bring the plant in from out of doors, there may be insects that go along with that. Just make sure you wash off those plants before you bring them in. Just take a strong stream of water and knock them off of there. Uh, one other thing is powdery mildew. It tends to be a problem as well indoors because if you're keeping it cooler, that along with uh, low light, Powdery mildew is a problem, so you just want to make sure you have good air circulation and to watch out for that. All right, if you move to your next slide, is some contact information for me. So if you have any questions down the road, I'd certainly be glad to uh, help you, uh, preferably by sending it to my email address there, which is schmidt1 at illinois.edu. And then finally on the Last slide, if you will, is uh, if the representatives from the offices that are presenting tonight would go to the online evaluation and report your uh, attendance numbers. So with that, uh, to this point, uh, I'd be glad to take, I'm going to take some verbal questions here, let's say for the next five minutes, and then we'll go to the chat room. Jim, can you um, tell us what plants or what herbs would be best for deterring deer? 
I don't know that that deer bother a whole lot of herbs simply because of their because of the fragrances is what what people have told me. I have not seen any particular list per se. There may be the one exists, but I I don't know that they bother many of them. Jim, we've got a question here uh, asking if caraway recedes. Caraway will recede. Okay, thanks. There's a question here about uh, stevia. Um, mm. I I have seen stevia plants for sale. Um, I don't know that it gets really large. I haven't grown it myself. I have seen it for sale at various places. I've seen people buy it and grow it. Um, stevia being a sugar replacement. Um, I mean, it grows. I, I would treat it very similarly to bay. And, you know, you can use the leaves throughout the season. But uh, it's not hardy, so you would have to grow it indoors. You have to bring it indoors or grow it indoors. There was also a question about uh, bringing herbs back out in the spring. So it's kind of the reverse of in the fall, is that I would do it gradually. Um, like today, which I, I can't speak for Chicago, but I, I am assuming it was pretty nice up there as well, is that you want to start bringing them out gradually. So maybe an hour or two like today, maybe an hour or two tomorrow. Um, and as long as the weather stays well above freezing, uh, like in the 50s or 60s, you know, you increase that for a couple of weeks and and then the plant's good to go but you need to do it gradually you don't want to take the plants from indoors and then put them out in a bright sunny spot the, the next day because that that plant's going to burn up because it's not used to that really bright light got a question here about lemon balm growing indoors with the leaves turning black um the could, leaves turning black could be a lot of things i I, I would check either humidity, moisture on the plants. Maybe it's too dry. Uh, could well be humidity, humidity, lack of humidity. And when it's so dry and our, our homes don't have enough humidity in it to grow a lot of things. So it could be a combination between the watering, low humidity issue. Uh, I'm going to try and go back and see some of the questions that are in here. Uh, dill can dill be grown alongside other herbs and um, absolutely um, usually I mean if you're creating an herb garden usually you want to scale things I mean together so it's usually short plants and then medium plants and then tall plants but absolutely I've seen dill incorporate a lot of things and I've seen it uh, you often see dill planted in a vegetable garden because it's just really a nice addition in there and it attracts the it attracts butterflies so beautifully Um, there is a question here about Mexican oregano, and Mexican oregano, as far as I know, is uh, more treated as an annual. I've not seen it grown outdoors as a, uh, I've not seen it as a perennial. I've seen it grown as an annual. I have seen it as an ornamental, but I also have seen it edible. Um, I was on a tour last summer to a place where uh, a chef was using it which was hard for me to believe because Cuban oregano if you've as these really fuzzy leaves and I could never ever un figure out how they ate it that way but it is used as a it is used as an edible it has a very pungent smell to it but um, it is not perennial here rosemary with new stem tips with a white powder I'm guessing that's powdery mildew so that, I'm guessing that's what it is, not being able to see it. Um, is it a problem? Well, it is a problem. Uh, if this is indoors, I would probably just cut it back to try to eliminate that. Other questions out there from the audience? Okay, go ahead. Does any of these herbs keep, um, like, rabbits and squirrels and possums away? Do they keep rabbits, squirrels, or possums 
I don't know that squirrels bother them. Um, I suppose rabbits might. I can't say that I've eaten. I've seen rabbits bother them either. I can't speak about the possums. I'm guessing. I, I do. I, let me ask you. You mean to do a repel them? Yeah. Oh, to repel them? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Are there any herbs uh, that are especially good for companion planting? I know it's not a class on companion planting, but are there any that stand out that might be good for that, for vegetables? Uh, there's a lot of people who use basil. Some people use dill. Um, trying to think off the top of my head here. There's a number of them, actually, that people put as companion plants. Okay. Someone had a question about a uh, bay laurel that's grown into a shrub, uh, a shrubby tree. Um, do I open it up, section it, and replant the sections? I, unless I'm misunderstanding the question, I doubt there's anything to divide from it. Uh, I mean, it might be shrubby, but I doubt there's, I mean, it's usually one crown. There, so there's really nothing to divide per se. Um, there w was a suggestion, uh, plant mint in the ground in a five gallon container. And that is absolutely right. If you're growing mints would be to grow them in a container that doesn't have drainage holes and you sink that container in the ground with the top above the soil line, because if it's flush with the soil, then the mint's simply going to grow right over the top of it. But that is a way to keep mints from, uh, getting out of hand. Someone asked about what herbs are good for bees, certainly the thymes are excellent for attracting uh, bees. Other questions from the audience? What would I use to kill the mint on lemon balm? I wanted to get rid of it because I didn't have too much. What to kill link and uh, what to kill uh, mint okay. and lemon balm? Yeah. Um, well, if you are in, probably the best thing to use would be a non-selective uh, killer such as Roundup. That will do it. That'll do it. It may take more than one application, so I would spray it. Be sure that you are. Uh, be sure that you do it on a very calm day so it doesn't drift onto other things, but that will, uh, that should take care of it. Like I said, more, you might do, need to do more than one spray of it. Thank you. Yeah, mint, I mean, seriously, mint is a great plant, but it will go everywhere. Other questions from the uh, audience that is out there? I think I've tried to do all the questions from the chat room. Uh, I certainly have appreciated you being at our uh, presentation tonight, so hopefully we have a good spring and no more. I saw some email today. Somebody said something about snow next week, and I hope that was really just a joke. No joke. No joke. Thanks very much, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank Happy you. Thank you. Happy spring. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.